Fan Appreciation Day today is a great day. Uh, we got the most positive, supportive fan base in the country, and certainly appreciate them. I know our guys are excited to, to spend the afternoon with them. A lot of parents are in town for the practice this morning, so that was good. And this is the first time in the stadium for a lot of our young guys, especially. Uh, so, so, so that's exciting. Eight practices in, and uh, you know, I think you take our first two units. I mean, our first units on offense and defense, and a core group of special teams players, you know, there's some really good things happening. Uh, as we continue to matriculate down our roster, you know, there's a lot, far too many inconsistencies you know, occurring in through eight days. And we've got to continue to improve that. The you know, training camp to me is all about conditioning the mind. You know, conditioning the mind, hardening the mind for the season, for, uh, battling through, through fatigue, heat, soreness, and uh, no, more guys with energy and urgency uh, on our football team. That's what we need. There are far too many uh, issues today. We had about a half practice, half scrimmage. We had about 100 scrimmage snaps. No procedure issues, which was great. I think we had uh, Keyshawn out of targeting, which we got to work on that. We had an SEC crew here today. Uh, we had one hands to the face and pass rush, and I think a holding on offense, and that was it for those, for those snaps. So that was good, especially for the first time when the coach is off the field. Uh, really good in the red zone by our offense. Uh, scored on, on four straight possessions, which was outstanding. Uh, about 50-50 on third down, which on both units, you know, we, we were, gave up a lot of drives last year defensively, not getting off the field on third down and not converting offensively. So we've con continued to make those two points of emphasis for our team, red zone and third down. Uh, we'll start with some one-minute stuff tomorrow. Uh, and, and get some more scrimmage snaps on Monday. And that's where you really are starting to make your evaluations and determinations uh, of where you are as a player and where we are as a football team. As far as injuries concerned, long-term injuries, Ty Tyreek Johnson tore his ACL. It was in a non-contact situation. You know, hurt for him. Uh, he's going to be a really good player for us. Uh, frustrating for him, he tore his labrum and his shoulder uh, his senior year of high school. We delayed his enrollment so he could rehab it. And now he has this happen. He had a fantastic spring, but uh, this is just a speed bump for him. He's going to be a really good football player. Unfortunate that he'll miss this fall. And Caleb Kinlaw uh, really hurt for Caleb at being a senior. Uh, again, another non-contact injury, uh, planted on his foot, and, and his knee gave out. And uh, really hurt for him here being a senior year and a very good special teams contributor for us last year. Uh, but those are the only two long-term. Jesus Gibbs had a scope on his meniscus. He'll be back in a couple weeks. Other than that, we've had the normal bumps and bruises of camp uh, that guys are battling through, and uh, that's really it on the injury front. I'll open up for any questions. Raise your hand. I'll get a microphone to you, Dave. Will, you mentioned uh, Caleb. I mean, with the fifth year, is there maybe a chance to get a sixth year for him, or is that – We need to look at that. I'm, I'm not sure. You know, it just happened. We just got really got the MRI, I think, two days ago, and, and – uh, so, you know, just really hurt for him. You know, saw his mom and dad last night and uh, uh, just, uh, you know, frustrated. You know, the first – last year was so much fun for them to be here and then be able to see all of his home games and some of his away games. You know, he's at Wisconsin and the junior college before that and uh, just frustrating for that family. You spoke prior to camp about Jemias' traits at safety. Now that you're on the field with him, just what do you, how do you think he's adjusting to that? Just meeting too inconsistent right now. Steven Montax had a really good camp at safety. Other than that, we're, we're struggling. Uh, Nick Harvey, we're going, we've repped at safety some. He's also playing corner. Nick Lee's really smart. Jemias has repped in there. JT Ebay's still not been cleared. I think Wednesday's when he's going to be cleared uh, to be able to do some individual and some skeleton. I'm not sure about contact. Uh, Clint will let me know on that. But uh, we're, not, we're not very good at that position right now. Was there anybody in particular who hurt y'all with RPO last year? Uh, Georgia, you know, Fromm was very accurate um, in um, in the Georgia game, just off the top of my head. Um, oh, t -t 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 that would be the game that jumped out at me. Uh, you know, Clemson hit a, hit, a, hit, a, hit a couple balls. Kelly hit a couple balls. Uh, I mean, just right off the top of my head, those would be the teams that would jump out at me. As the the way things go, offenses innovate and defenses come up. Find a counter. What's the count? What what counters are evolving for that RPO defensively? Recruiting guys that can play man to man. You can Is win in you can win in man coverage. 
And that's where that's that's where you get into matchup issues, Josh. To be honest with you, if you you got to win in man coverage, the, the problem when you're playing zone against RPOs is the run pass conflicts it can it creates for your linebackers. So then you got if you want to play zone, then you got to get into canceling gaps, what we call pirate the front. You know the three technique and the six technique slant inside, uh, slant and the five technique inside to take away the bubble, so the backer doesn't have direct runs and you're trying to bounce the runs east and west if you want to play zone. But you can't ask a guy to carry a guy vertical and play the A-gap. It's impossible. Uh, so those are the things to me that you really, when you play teams that run a lot of RPOs, are very difficult to do, is canceling the gaps and playing zone. The answer is you got to recruit man-to-man. -man. Then the issue you get in is can we match up against some of these guys? You know, people want to play us in man coverage, I'd, I'd, I'd be happy about it. Will, how are uh, Rosendo and Taven Jackson? Uh, Taven's had some heat issues and missed a couple days and uh, hoping to get him back this week. Rosendo, I think, will be cleared Wednesday. Had a shoulder uh, in a non-contact situation, fell down on it. So I guess he did have contact with the ground, so it wasn't totally non-contact. But um, was in, we weren't even in shoulder pads. And, uh, but he's been in all the walkthroughs. He's been taking part of some of all that stuff. Uh, he's got the sling off. He looks, he looks good. He looks better than that picture he put on the Internet. We've been hearing a lot about the two freshman corners, uh, mm -hmm. J.C. and Israel. How have they looked to you? J.C. had an interception in the red zone today. He's going to play a bunch. He's a good football player. He's got a good work ethic. He has really good ball skills down the field. He matches up well against some really good receivers that we have. Uh, but he's really progressed well. Israel's a guy that took the next step. And our challenge after spring ball was strength. You got to get stronger. You got to be able to win on the line of scrimmage more, using your length that God's blessed you with, but also being stronger on the line of scrimmage. And he's answered those calls. And I watched the film from today, but he's progressed well. Uh, Coach, aside from conditioning, when you're talking about the offensive line getting adjusted to the tempo offense, what are some of the other challenges that they face, and how important is it to be able to have those guys up to speed with it? Well, there's no question. That's the, the biggest issue is the conditioning element of being able to, to play fast. We have a tempo period in every practice where you're, you're conditioned to, to running to the football, to getting set, ID and where you need to block, and, and having your eyes in the right spots. And that's where, really, to me, you know, it's a, more of a focus issue as much as it is anything else to be dialed into what your job description is, the execution of your job, and then, and then obviously finishing it. Well, we're just more cognizant of, of periods of team where, where, where there's, I tell Brian, it mix the tempos. If you want to go fast, go fast. Uh, then we have certain team periods where it's more of a teaching uh, element to it that we're able, we're able to coach the players within, the, you know, within a series. Uh, so I think those are the things that, you know, we have certain periods where we're going to go as fast as we can go. We're going to mix the tempo, dictate the tempo of the practice or the game. And then there are certain periods where I think you need to do a good job of teaching and coaching your players. Now that you've seen some of your first-year linemen in pads, what are your impressions of those guys to this point? The linemen? Yes. On which side of the ball? Both sides. First oh, here we go. Both sides. <laughs> Uh, Dylan Warnham has got really good athleticism, exactly what we felt in the recruiting process. Uh, you know, really moves well. I, I'm very pleased with, with where he is right now. Um, Jordan Rhodes was redshirted last year, but I think has made tremendous strides, plays extremely hard. Uh, a guy that, you know, we think has got a really good future as well. Uh, Hank Manos has done some really nice job at the center position. Uh, Javon Gwynn is a guy that, you know, has power and athleticism, has just got to learn more of what to do. It's more of that's the issue. It's not the athleticism. It's not the power. It's not the punch. I mean, those are, those are things that you all see within what, what he's able to bring to, uh, to what you're doing. Wyatt Campbell's been slowed a little bit with a knee. Uh, he's missed some, missed some practice. Uh, we've got to get him back out there. It's nothing long term, but we've we got to get him back on the field. Um, defensively, J.J. Con continues to uh, play well. Uh, we've got to continue to work on, on our defensive line and really both lines of scrimmage, pad level. You know, sometimes when you do when you get into too much tempo, you get fatigued, and, and that's really when you start playing with high pad level, and that's something we've got to improve on. Uh, Ricky Sandage has done some really nice things. Can really anchor and hold the point. Uh, is an explosive guy, and needs just to continue to learn what we're doing. I would say the same thing for Jabari Ellis, who's just been cleared about f three days ago, and have shown some things, showed some flashes to me of running and having playing with some effort and some toughness, which was exciting. Um, uh, is that it for the freshman? I'm just trying to think in the top of my mind. 
Josh has got to go through the NCAA acclimatization period, so he will be in shells tomorrow uh, and uh, shells Monday, uh, and, then, and then in full gear as we move into the next week. Why was Josh out for a few days at the start? He, he just had to be cleared for his physical. That's an NCAA issue? No, it's physical. Physical issue. You mentioned Taven Jackson with the heat. How do you guys monitor that? What, what, what are the markers there that you say, okay, we need to give him a – Well, I think there's certain guys that, you know, when we go through the uh, physical part of it, when they come on campus and their initial, you know, physical is guys we ID that may have had heat issues before. And uh, we have trainers that, that, that monitor them throughout. You know, if they see any signs of fatigue that they don't feel is good, uh, that's their call. They pull them off the field. So we, I think Clint Haggard and our staff do a fantastic job of monitoring uh, those kind of issues. In, in regard to Belk, it looks like Georgia just got a transfer cleared. They do seem to be leaning that way more. Have you, you guys gotten any indication of – We haven't process? gotten any feedback. We're still going through that process and filing our appeal for Josh and, and certainly uh, would feel you know, good about where things are headed, certainly. You'd feel optimistic just based on the trend that you're seeing? Based on what I'm seeing, absolutely. I think that you know, he's got a very good case in his situation with his family that he, he should be eligible. Conditioning-wise, is he ready to help you all this year, or is that, is that okay? Is he okay where he is? Well, we, we, need to, we need to trim a little bit. Yeah. Is that doable in the – his window has been short. Oh, so yeah, it's a now. long season. We're, so we're, we're working toward that, you know, and I think you look at the job our nutrition staff did with Javon Kinlaw, you know, it's a process, and you got to buy into that, and Josh has certainly welcomed, you know, the things that we're trying to do. What's his weight now? I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> Will, how's the kicking competition going? Good. I mean, those guys are all battling it out. And uh, Shane and Parker and, and Alex have all had their moments and uh, just need to more be more consistent, putting them under some more duress, especially moving forward tomorrow with some one minute. Um, they'll be in some pressure situations. We've had eight practices. We've ended probably four or five practices with them having to make a field goal for our football team. So that, that's going to continue through camp. time with two a days not obviously part of it anymore how much easier is it to be able to plan things out this season in comparison to maybe last year and the second part of it is uh, how important is it being able to get these guys in the classroom for those extra hours well I think that you know they've they've passed some some good rules as far as walk through being able to have a ball and it's not nothing that we're exerting our players but you know guys learn in different ways some guys can learn from the film some guys can learn from the schematic you put on paper and some guys they they have to rep it they have to walk through it uh, we use all three we put it on paper we put it on film and we walk through and uh, you know we find out learning wise how they learn when they get here and what is their best form of learning and, and we're going to employ those methods as we move forward but you know we're getting enough out of the one a day practices and and, uh, and trying to you know harden and condition them for the season yeah, more scrutiny of college football yesterday with that Maryland story, and and you know you're known as a really hard-nosed, tough-minded coach. Where do you draw that line, you and your staff, to where you make sure you don't step across that line into a, a, a situation similar to what's being a, alleged at Maryland? Well, I think the, the the big thing is is criticism. You need to criticize the performance, not the performer. And I think that that's something we talk about as a staff a lot. And there's a certain way you can talk to a young man and about how he's playing and what he needs to do to improve. Um, you know what? I know DJ Durkin. He worked for me for four years at the University of Florida. He is his, are an outstanding football coach. But he's also an outstanding husband and a father, and he treats people with respect. And I will use your word, alleged article. There's no credibility in anonymous sources. You know, if that former staffer had any guts, why didn't he put his name on that? I think that's gutless. And in any business and in any company and in any football team, especially right here in August, you can find a disgruntled player that's probably not playing. So I think it's a lack of journalistic integrity to print things with anonymous sources. But I know DJ Durkin personally, and I know what kind of man he is. I know what kind of person he is. I talked to him this morning, and I don't think it's right. So, next question. Jeff, 
how has Rico Dowdle looked? Has really he done, good. done the things? That Had a really good day yesterday. It was our player of the day offensively. It was our, uh, our effort of the day offensively. I thought he had a couple nice runs today. He's in probably the best shape he's been since he's been here. Strong. Um, I've been really proud of how he has responded to our challenges, my challenges to him, uh, to take the next step. And uh, I think, I mean, again, competition helps that too. Mon Denson's look good. AJ Turner's look good. Tyson Williams has looked good. All three of the, all four of those guys have had their moments in camp that you, you're excited about what's happening, but that's what competition does for you. I guess what, what are the main things, you know, you scrimmage day, you're about to scrimmage more on Monday. What are the main things you kind of can take from a scrimmage and can learn from, from that kind of scenario? That's the closest thing you can simulate to game day. The coaches are off the field. The players are making decisions. They're making decisions and choices every play, whether it's key diagnosed from, a, from an offensive side or a defensive side or a special teams and the decisions they make on the field, the effort they play with, all the intangible qualities we talk about, effort, toughness, discipline, team first mentality and competing and earning every snap. None of those things take ability. And you find out a lot about guys when you get off the field and they've got to play on their own. It's a little different when you're sitting in seven on seven and you're telling the guy where his eyes need to be and what his execution of his job's got to be and it's all those things. So I think it's the closest thing we can get to game day without 80,000 be people being there. Coach, building off that, you've talked about concerns at the safety position. So how critically important did the scrimmages become and then the meetings afterwards to really get that group where you want them to be by the opener? Well, we got some time, fortunately. So that's, that's, a, that's a fortunate part of it. But uh, we need more attention to detail, you know, something we've talked to our team about about after every practice, the attention to detail. We, we had a, a live goal line the other day. And in a situation, we had a busted offensive play, a, an alignment defensively all sides, and, a, and an illegal motion procedure in four plays. You know? So those are the things. It's just the doubles and the details of what we do. And we've got to continue to understand that at the safety position, if you make a mistake, the other band's playing. Well, so that's, it's a critical mistake when you make one. It's, the three technique gets bounced out of the B gap. We probably have somebody make up for it. Uh, but we don't on the back end. And we've got to heighten our sense of urgency, awareness, and, and production. We've got to have more production from those positions. Do you get a report on how much your guys are on their iPad out of the building mm -hmm. studying film? What does that tell you? Well, I think... I always ask the question, how much time do you spend on ball when you're not required to? Because the really good players I've been around, they spend a lot of time on it. I mean, I coached Zach Thomas at the Miami Dolphins. He would come in on Saturday morning with a notebook pad of multiple pages of questions about what are you going to call here, what are you going to call here, what do you think here, what are you thinking there, what are you thinking on third medium, what are you thinking on first and 10, 12 personnel. I mean, and the guy was, should be in the Hall of Fame one day. Uh, that's what really good players do. So when you're able to sit there and look at an iPad and see that a young man spending time at night away from ball, you know, that means a lot. You know, because uh, and playing the game mentally can help you as much as playing the game physically. And in order to to be a really good player, you have to be able to do that. Now a lot of guys come in and want to watch film with us. They don't want to watch it on their own. But I, I think part of a young man watching film is learning how to watch the film the right way. Because everybody, it's not you don't just stare at the ball. You know, you take a safety, for instance. You've got to scan the formation. What is the width of the formation on both sides? What are the splits of the formation? What's the backfield set? Is it one back? Is it two back? If it's one back, it's either a two-by-two two or a three-by-one set, unless it's a quad set. If it's a two-back set, it's two-by-one or, or a, a one-by-two, right? Yeah, yeah, obviously. So those are things, <laughs> those are things that, I, that you teach guys how to watch the film. You don't watch it just like you're watching a game on Saturday afternoon and most people just follow the ball. That's not how you watch film. You watch film, you know, if you're a three technique, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to watch the guard. I'm going to see what his set is. I'm going to see how his splits are. I'm, I mean, those are all things that we try to teach our players on how to watch film the right way. Can, can you kind of take us through the process of getting Jamel Cook here and what have you seen out of him early? Well, you know, Jamel was a guy we've, we've been recruiting for a long time from Central High School, played with Kier Thomas, uh, a really talented guy that's got some ability. Um, reached out to us uh, was with his intentions to transfer. I called Clay Helton, the head coach of uh, Southern Cal. He's a good friend of mine. And uh, Clay helped us, and I appreciate him you know, helping Jamel get here. Uh, 
so I think another situation where we're going to try and appeal for his immediate eligibility because some issues at home. Uh, so we'll, we'll, we'll work through that process with the NCAA, but I'm excited he's here. I've known him for a long time. Is he is he at corner for y'all? Yeah, he's playing corner. Yeah. Bryce and Allen Williams seems to be particularly excited and fired mm -hmm. up to be sure. back out there. How, how has he looked? Oh, he's looked good. I mean, I think, you know, that was a huge blow to us last year as far as pass rush is concerned with four guys. Bryson gives you a lot, an edge presence to really win on the edge with speed. You know, he, he plays extremely hard. He's a leader. Uh, he's a guy that, uh, you know, has played a lot of football here at South Carolina, has been a very productive player for us. And uh, that was a huge blow for us and him. And psychologically, he's worked extremely hard on the mental side of it and physically. And I think he's having a good camp. All right, thank you.